People don't leave jobs, they leave their managers. Your managers come to me and said, oh, so-and-so's a nightmare in my team. I can't deal with them, they're gonna have to go. Kate Waterfall Hill. She's the leadership coach, TikTok creator of Linda, the toxic boss. She's here to help you realize your full leadership potential. There's a difference between leadership and management, showing up in an authentic way. You want to be yourself as a leader, but at the same time, you've got to be the best version of yourself. When you're an out of alignment with your organization or your person you work with, that's where you get that tension. It's just the way I am, you know. What's the reward for working really hard and doing really well and being a really high performing member of the team? What's sort of being given more to do, really? Your core values should be what you do, even when nobody's looking. As a leader, you don't want somebody who's coming into the office constantly asking you for advice. Do you want everyone to be going through that door every five minutes asking you what they're supposed to be doing? Have you noticed any differences in leadership styles between men and women? Welcome back to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Borostovsky. Can I ask you a favor? Help me reach 1,000 subscribers and leaving a comment in the comments below that you have subscribed. Your support means that I can bring more inspiring change makers to show you how to transform your career and become a better leader yourself. Thank you so much. Kate, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. So my first experience was finding you on TikTok as I'm scrolling at night looking for inspiration hmm. tips and then all of a sudden i see this character called linda the toxic boss that you probably have experienced <laughs> in your life one way or another and i just thought it was brilliant and how you managed to really cut through the messages in terms of kind of toxic work culture all the things basically that happen that are wrong in the office environment my first question to you is like who inspired this colorful character Oh gosh, well she looks very, very much like me. <laughs> she sounds just like me. You never see us both in the same room at the same time. Um, who inspired her? Well, I, it was because I was trying to work out a way of getting the message out to more people, I suppose. It's the simplest thing. And I'd done a lot of stuff on Instagram where I was doing reels, walking along with my dog and sort of saying, you know, if you're trouble, having trouble with procrastination, then try these three tips. And I was getting a little bit of traction and it was, it was you know, working quite well, but no leads, which is obviously the important thing when you're in business to, to, um, for my coaching business. Um, and then I started doing LinkedIn more and more and I was getting a bit more traction there and, the, and, and a, a few uh, contacts out of that. I've got a 20 year old and an 18 year old and they're all over TikTok, as you can imagine. And I thought, I can do that. I can do that. And I, I literally don't even really know where the first one came from. But I was, it was a you know, cold January evening, had a glass of wine. The kids are all in their rooms. My husband's doing something else. I thought, oh, I'll give it a little go. Why not? It'll be fun. And I just had this one idea that had actually come up from a coaching conversation, recorded that one. And it just, it got traction literally straight away. So I thought, well, I'll do another one tomorrow and I'll do another one. And then, you know, I, I was used to be in marketing and I know that one of the key things for marketing is to be consistent, to keep showing up, to not, you know, to sort of not be embarrassed about it, but keep showing up, keep showing up. And I've basically done a TikTok every day since. That's amazing. <laughs> How do you balance having this sort of alter ego, kind of funny persona and then the serious side, which is the leadership coaching, which is what your main business is. And like, yeah. how do you marry those two? Like, how do you balance that? Well, actually, it's a really good outlet for me because I suppose I've got a creative bent you know, to me because I used to be in marketing and uh, and I've sort of, as I said to you before, wanted to be in TV, but I haven't quite sort of had, had my break yet, but maybe I will, you know, who knows? Uh, it's not too late. And, Never too um, late. Exactly. <laughs> so it's a good way of having that sort of creative, you know, like some people like to do crafting in the evening. Well, I like doing TikToks in the evening, so, or the weekends. Um, and so it works quite well for me that way. And also, I suppose part of it is, is sort of, venting a little bit about the frustrations that I feel because I still am you know working as a consultant I still do go to offices and go to meetings and sit there thinking oh my goodness we're here again you know so it's a way of me having a little bit of a laugh about that mm. in fact I went to one of my clients yesterday and I walked in the door and the finance manager said you know that video you did last week that was so and so wasn't it and I'm like um <laughs> do you feel like when you're going into meetings now people have to be a little bit more like yeah. careful around you in case you provide them more, more oh, yeah. content for your TikTok yeah definitely yeah. definitely they see me get my notebook out and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, definitely. Is <laughs> because an it's like being friends with like authors who pay yeah. attention to everything you're saying and doing in your life to yes. for material for for their books. Yeah. No, I think what you're doing is is great because just using humor to break through and really talk about all the things that we already know that are happening that are the toxic culture, the toxic boss, you know, things that we we know shouldn't be happening. Like what's What's the best thing that you have seen that happened as a result of using humour to talk about these issues? Well, it just it, getting to lots and lots of different people and highlighting the issue, getting people talking about it in their offices. And I was talking to, to you know various people and they said, oh, yeah, I, I love that that one. I sent that to my friend. I sent this to my boss. And, that you know, people are sitting around, it seems, in their offices actually sharing my... T- oh, no, but I like really like this one. So that having that conversation about the things that that go wrong, like people not doing their team members one-to-ones on time, that people not taking their one-to-ones seriously, not setting good objectives, not you know having meetings that are meaningful, loads and loads of different things that are sort of themes through the different videos I do. If, if I can, through humour, make people more aware of themselves and notice their own behaviour and maybe their behaviour of their team members or sometimes their own bosses, it's starting a conversation. That was the point, really, to, to sort of have a... Yeah, you know, if I can have an influence on on anybody, you know, what, even one person to say, actually, yes, I'm a bit like that, but I need to notice my behaviour and change my behaviour. How do I do that? And obviously, my preference is that they, how do they do that? Is they they book a call with me and they get some coaching, but it might be that they listen to this podcast, that they read a decent leadership um, book, you know, that they just go and ask for some help from the HR team if they've got one to get some training and development. We can all do things to change how you know to upskill but it's noticing there's something missing in the first place being self-aware enough to say oh actually yes this isn't okay I need to change this that's the key so that's the first step noticing the need for change and then going and finding how you can change Mm. so just to paraphrase what you're saying it's it's to break through the ice and for the individual to realize like oh wait a second I'm a bit like Linda like I do these things but not feel shame to feel like oh there's a light-heartedness to it exactly. that actually that's the first step to recognizing the behavior and then thinking okay maybe yeah. then I need to change absolutely yeah. yeah and and some of the things like when I speak to people you know when they book a call with me to find out how the coaching with me works one of the things that I quite often say is I really wanted a, a somebody who can guide me who has experience and knows what they're doing and is qualified and experienced but isn't so serious that it's scary. I want to have some fun doing this, or, or at least some levity. Maybe not fun is probably too too uh, fl- flippant a word. But so it's 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 um, energizing. It's enlightening. It's uplifting. It's positive. It gives them clarity and purpose and feels like they're going somewhere. But it doesn't it doesn't feel like hard work doing it. Mm. You know that they actually look forward to the calls because they know they're going to get. They get you know one of my um, testimonials is. You know, Kate's great, does this, does this, does this. And then the last line she wrote was, and the best bit is that we have a lot of fun and we have a laugh doing it. You know, that's... It's important. Yeah. It's hard to admit that you're doing something wrong yeah. or that you need to change. What are the main signs that you're a poor leader? Like, how can you, re- you know, if you were not to watch any of your TikToks, like, yeah. how do you recognise in yourself that you're doing something wrong? Like, what are those signs? Well, I suppose it starts with what makes a good leader and then what's missing. Because to me, you know, there's, a, there's a difference between leadership and management, although they, they have obviously some of the same skills and some of them cross over. But in its simplistic form, and it's what I teach when I'm doing um, leadership training, um, either workshops or on the course that I run, is there are three different elements. For me, it, the leader is the one that sets the vision, gives you the why as Simon Sinek would say, um, and the manager gives you the what, you know, so the expectations, the deliverables, the, the outcome that's desired, the deadlines, the budget, the resources, the support, hopefully some training. And then the coach is the one that empowers you to, enables you to come up with the idea of how you're going to do it yourself. So it's the why, the what, and the how. And where leaders sometimes get it wrong is that they are too prescriptive in the what in the management bit and they also prescribe the how so they're micromanagers so they're there telling you exactly what you should do and how you should do it and checking up on you all the time then just not giving you any vision at all not giving you any idea of what the purpose is what how your role fits in with the overall team objective or even the organization's objectives 
and um, yeah, just sort of not communicating. You know, the leader that shuts the door. One of the videos I do is, um, oh, welcome on your first day at the office. Oh, that's brilliant. You know, my door's always open, and then cut to. I haven't got time to speak to you, <laughs> you know, mm. go, go in. and that inconsistency is the other thing that is a big bugbear of lots of people that you get the the boss who's your best friend when they want to tell you an anecdote about their weekend but doesn't want to hear about yours <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's like what you say and what you do yeah. are two completely different things yeah. or what you expect of others but yet you don't do yourself yeah. yeah so there's a bit of there's a lot about vision a lot about leading by example about consistency accountability responsibility um, you know, showing up in an authentic way that you know, you want to be yourself as a leader, but at the same time, you've got to be the best version of yourself so you can bring out the best in others. Mm. It's not easy. Mm. It's not easy. But as, as I said before, if you can recognize where you're gapping, then you can work out how to fill the gap. Yeah. So on the flip side, if you are an employee who is kind of unhappy, but you're not quite sure why, like, how do you spot the toxic boss? Like, what are they specifically doing mm -hmm. to make themselves and the culture toxic? Well, I suppose it's just that thing that they, they, they're not giving you any time. They're not showing you the, the vision. They're not giving you the purpose. Mm. Um, and they're, you know, inconsistent with how they're over criticizing in public, you know, humiliating other people, and, you know, not apologizing for when things go wrong, stealing other people's ideas. I mean, there's a litany of, I mean, that's why I've mm. been able to do nearly 300 videos because there's literally <laughs> just, just so much material. A lot of people say to me, how do you, how do you, have you done so many videos? I'm like, I literally, I'm falling over myself to, you know, I've got, I've Never got lists ends. and lists. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm always walking along, mm -hmm. you know, writing oh, another idea and another mm -hmm. idea. So, um, yeah, I mean, saying saying you know what make what makes a bad leader is like saying what makes a bad person. It's just mm -hmm. there's too many. It's just <laughs> countless. Unfortunately, things. yeah. So as a as an employee working with a toxic boss, like what can you do? Like what advice can you give yeah. to that individual? How to deal with it? Well, it sort of depends on your relationship with that person. So you know, first first step if you could would be to ask for some time with them if you can get time with them and actually have an open and honest conversation that's without judgment and I think that's quite an important part of it that without judgment piece because if you go into a meeting with your boss and say look I want to speak to you because I don't like the way you manage me you know it's not going to be a great conversation mm. it's going to be a, you know already it's got off to a bad start but if you can say I'd, I'd love to have a conversation with you about how we work together because I just don't feel we're getting the best out of each other and make it a sort of mutual conversation. And this actually can be the leader saying it to the team member or the, or the other way around. It doesn't matter who starts the conversation if there's a disconnect. Um, you know, can we reset and work out a way of working together? What's well, a really nice way of doing it? And it's, you know, sometimes it feels like as a team member, you shouldn't have to take responsibility for this. But if you've got a lead, uh, you know, manager who's just not doing it, then you might need to take responsibility to suggest either a team, if there's a, if there's a general team feeling that the, that the leader's not, not, you know, being a very good leader, um, is to get together as a group and say, okay, let, let's share what we like you know, how we like to be communicated with, how we like feedback to be given, um, you know, the times of day that we're at our best, um, what sort of information we like to get in a brief, how often we like to be checked in on, and have a sort of a, a checklist of the way you like to work with each other. And some people will say, oh, I love communicating by email. Other people will say face-to-face. -face. Some people will say on Slack or, you know, mm. monday.com or whatever the, you know, the format is in that particular office. And actually just having a sort of an understanding of how you want to work with each other is useful. Mm. So, yeah, it's all, it's all about having an open conversation that's not accusatory, that's not going to mm. start a war. <laughs> it's a terrifying conversation to have with your boss. I mean, of yeah. all the people to have that conversation with, a difficult conversation, that's probably the top, most stressful things yeah. a person goes through in their job. Mm. And having the right language to use, yeah. and as you said, that checklist to go through, it's almost like you have to, first of all, work out what you want, Yes, have the right questions to, to hand yeah. and then kind of like go yeah. in there being super prepared yeah. Yeah. and it might be that it's too hard to do that just on your own just to one-to-one -one. it might be that you have a colleague who also feels the same and you go together but you don't want to gang up on the mm. other manager or you might have to go to HR and sort of say there's a tension with, with me and my line manager can I report to somebody different or it might be another leader on the same level or maybe higher than your manager and going to them and saying can, is there anything that can be done about this because I don't feel comfortable. So, you, know, it, you know, I think bad management needs to be called out. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's okay just to put up with it. But ultimately, if you, you know, sometimes leaders are protected by their 
leaders or, or they're, the, they're the owner themselves and you can't do anything about it. In which case, I sort of say to people, be really sure of your next move because um, you know, if you, if you know yourself well enough, if you've done work on your values, which is one of my really key things that I do in my coaching is to really help people understand their, their core beliefs, their principles, they're like really firmly held, you know, this is really important to me. If you can do some work on that, either with a coach or, or um, on your own, with some really sort of heartfelt self-reflection, if you can define who you are as a person, then you, your boundaries are really clear. And you can also realize why you may be in, not in alignment with somebody else. So if, for instance, one of your values is um, honesty and integrity, this is a really easy demonstration of, of the, the concept of values. But if, you're, if you're, one of your values is honesty and integrity, it's really important to you. I mean, most people, hopefully good people, are, feel like that. But you know, lots of people have really, really important to them. And the person they work with or their manager or their organization actually is a little bit fast and loose with the truth maybe a little white lies here and there or maybe even deliberate you know oh fiddle your expenses say you work 60 hours on that project when actually you only did 30 those sorts of things when you're an out of alignment with your organization or your person you work with that's that's where you get that tension mm -hmm. and and if you just feel uncomfortable with somebody you can't work out why and you, therefore you don't know what to do about it if you do some work on your values think about how they demonstrate their values and that can unlock something sometimes mm. to sort of go oh i see now so i had a client the other day who was doing work on her values and she was describing to me how her boss gives her work and how it really really makes her feel uncomfortable and we were digging a bit deeper into that and it basically she said i need to know why she needs it she just gives me this stuff to do and i feel like i've already done it and it's just more work for no reason so i want to know why and i don't know who it's for and i just don't get the you know get so i want to know who and she doesn't give me a deadline. I want to know when. So I just want to know why, who, and when. Those are the three things. And when she it described it to me, it's sort of almost like, oh, well, yeah. Now, now I've defined what it is I need from her. She said, oh, I remember now. My, my core values when I was doing that work with you was clarity, wasn't it? And I'm now realizing now why I don't get on with my boss is she never gives me any clarity. Mm. Her core value was clarity. This woman's value obviously wasn't. She didn't give the brief well enough. But because she'd been able to sort of put words to these feelings and these emotions and this tension, she could go to her line manager and say, I've done some work on my values with my coach. One of them is clarity. What I'd love from you and what would make me really happy and would me work well and more efficiently and more productively, which is what a line manager always mm. wants to hear, is if you could give me a really clear brief because I love clarity. So if you could give me the who, why, in the wrong order, why, <laughs> who and when, yeah. that would be great. Mm. And it, was a, it wasn't it was um, your rubbish at being my manager and you're really bad at giving a brief. It was, this is what I need to make me better. And then it was an easier conversation. So mm. it's it's having those, those that sort of way of framing things and the way of wording things that really unlocks relationships with people, I mm. think. Talking about mm. values, do you have a framework that you like to use or a book someone can read or refer to to work out values for themselves? Um, I have a, a Find Your Purpose module, which is part of my coaching program. So if, you, if I have a, a, a client who's doing my six-month program, they get it as part of that. And um, yeah, it's quite comprehensive. It's, I think it's a 37-page workbook. Um, and it's a lot of self-reflection. So uh, you know, the first main chunk of it is... Um, you know, working out when you were at your best, you know, can you recall, you know, how, when you felt that you were really in flow, that you were really positive and feeling um, productive? Um, can you get some feedback? Can you look at feedback that you've had in the past? It could be when you were a student even, or, you know, mm -hmm. earlier on in your career or yesterday from, cu from customers, from peers, from line managers, your appraisals, whatever. Gather the evidence ask your friends, ask trusted colleagues now, I'm doing some work on my values, it would be really helpful if you could give me five words that you'd use to describe me. Simple as. People, you know, if, you're, if they're good friends, will we'll give you, I mean, like, friends of mine gave me like 35 words. Great. Very handy. And, and yeah, and then, and then it's a case of theming those and working out what, you know, what, the, what the main groups are and deciding maybe five, six values. And it might be that they sort of there are caught, there are other ones sort of subsets of the same thing, but you usually can get to about five or six. And then it's a case of looking at those and thinking, do I actually live my life in alignment with those values? Am I am I showing up? So picking that honesty and integrity one out again. If if that's one of your core values, actually, do I do that? Mm. You know, am I 
And if you're not, then maybe it, let's look at your behavior and change the behavior so you are in line with your values, or actually maybe that value isn't one of your values. You know, you think it is, you'd like it to be. I'd like one of my values to be generosity. I'm just not. <laughs> I'm just not, I, I know, you know, somebody comes around with a bucket to ask me for cash for something. I'm like, I'm a bit, oh my God, I've only got five pounds. I don't really want to give them five pounds. You know, I'm like that as a person. I know I am. I try harder, you know, I try to get the 20 pounds out. It's very honest of you. <laughs> it's the way I've been brought up, I think. You know, my parents were of that generation that money was tight, you know, and, mm. you know, everything was a struggle. So I sort of have, have sort of stayed with that. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I say, I do try to be better, but it's not one of my core values. I'd like it to be. So, um, yeah, the, the, your core values should be what you do, even when nobody's looking, mm -hmm. you know, not, not just what you think they should be. Anyway, so just to quickly finish that, the alignment with what your behavior is, your alignment with the people around you, the alignment with your organization and what you could do about that. So mm -hmm. that module, that whole thing is, is, a, is a quite a big piece mm -hmm. of work, but it's quite a good piece to work out who you are as a person, who you are as a leader, what your personal style might be, what your sort of brand might be as a leader. Um, how to, as I said before, how to be authentic and show up as yourself, but al but also this sort of polished version. Because you, you know, you know, some people sort of say, "Oh, well, this, this you know, how, how I am, a bit chaotic, a bit disorganised, not communicating terribly clearly, whatever the 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 um, fault is, as if, if you like." It's just the way I am, you know. You know what you know what so and so is like. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just like that. To my mind, that's not okay you know mm -hmm. if, if you know if you've got a fault that impacts other people and their um, efficiency their productivity their enjoyment of what they're doing then you know it needs a bit of polishing so mm -hmm. talk to me about this idea of being authentic because on the one hand you can say well that's just how i am yeah and that's just their authentic self and you're talking about being the best version of your authentic self yeah. or is your authentic self the self that goes back to your true values rather than the values that you want to be and then actively living those. It's a bit of a mixture mm. because um, to, to my mind, you know, if, if you think of all the role models that you might have, the, you know, the people who you really admire or aspire to be like, or even the most successful people, you know, and maybe you don't like them or, or want to be them, but you know, you think of them as being successful in their chosen field, whether it's sport or music or business. I, I don't believe you just wake up in the morning and get there you know I, I think you you know it's not just a happy accident sometimes it might be through circumstance and luck that they they come across the opportunities but generally speaking they grasp the opportunities to make them happen you know it's not just gifted to you so even if you, if you think about people who sort of say they fell into their career you know some actors for instance who just sort of fall into acting but actually what they've done is they've seen a goal potentially and they've made a plan and then they've worked hard to get there. You know, so even say, for instance, the, the best tennis players in the world, it's not easy, is it? You know, they practice and they practice and they and, and it's really, really hard and it's relentless and they're focused and they're determined. So if you want to be a good leader, just showing up and being like you are at home, you know, with your mates or with your family, you know, probably isn't good enough <laughs> because, you know, the, to, to be a good leader, you have to be intentional. You have to be deliberate about how you spend your time. You know, if, if, we, if you just screech into your chair in the morning for your first meeting um, or, you know, or dally into your chair and just look at your emails all day, yeah, you might get through the work, you might bumble along and be fine. But if you want to be something, if you want to be something different, if you want to be exceptional, if you want to, to really lead and have other people looking at you as a role model, then you need to think about it. And thinking about it often means, you know, thinking strategically, having time to to plan plan even if it's planning your day you know just working out am I, how long am i going to spend doing each thing am i going to just sit and look at my emails whatever but have meetings that are productive and efficient but also having an idea of thinking about being with your team spending time with them and then actually having time for yourself because that's also important because you can only run at 100 miles an hour for, lo for so mm. long um, before things implode no for sure i mean for i'll come back to what i think the top qualities for a leader are yeah. but i'd like to know what you think the top qualities of a leader like what's let's say top five i've got eight in my leadership thing communication open clear jargon free 
the right regularity, you know, not not too much blah, blah, blah. Uh, consistency, honesty, reliability, uh, accountability, taking responsibility, integrity. And that includes the mutual trust piece, which I could talk about again another time. Um, leading by example. And then there's a bit also for me about innovation as well. It's about thinking in a slightly different way from everybody else. You know, so, so is that creativity or? Can be. Right. Can be, yeah. So it's doing things in a different way or? Yeah, or just looking things. for opportunities to innovate. Mm. So not just doing stuff because that's how we've always done it. Mm. Yeah. There is something about that status quo, isn't it? Yeah. Where part of leadership is spotting where things have become redundant where whatever was done before isn't serving the world anymore because mm. like our lives have changed like even from when I was first in employed to what you know the office kind of politics look like now is so vastly different I mean throw in technology innovations to COVID to mm. you know having much more openness about even being sort of vulnerable so much has changed yeah. I mean what do you see from your experience that has changed with regards to expectations of our leaders in say the last 10 years? The first thing that comes to mind is mental health and approach to that. I think that's, you know, if I think 10 years ago, people just didn't talk about that. Um, and it was, um, I don't know, just sort of almost brushed onto the carpet if somebody was, was having a, a, you know, a really hard time and it was evident or it seemed that they might be having some sort of mental um, episode, it would be like, oh, well, they're not reliable, you know, or they, you know, oh, they're a bit flaky, you know, and words like this coming out, um, rather than looking for how they could be supported. People just didn't know how to deal with it. But I think we're, we're more educated better educated now than we were um people are more open as you said to being vulnerable um and also recognizing that that you know even people not even people those who ha have struggles are have also a lot to offer you know my 20 year old is autistic and has you know various different challenges in terms of how they approach how or how life approaches approaches them almost um but now they know they're autistic because it was a relatively late diagnosis. We've got ways of of um, of bringing out the best in them and then, we've got, and then bringing out the best in their own life. And so, yeah, I think it's about, again, having that open, honest conversation and saying, um, because people now can work from home, that can support that and this sort of hybrid working and flexibility approach, which don't, didn't happen. I mean, in, you know, when I was first in business, it was, you know, you had to be at your desk at nine o'clock and you had to be there till half past five or beyond. Um, and, and that was the only way you could be visibly seen to be working. You know, if you went to a meeting, we didn't, you know, I'm so old, we didn't have mobile phones routinely when I first started working. So you would go off to a meeting and if you didn't, we used to have a pool phone. So there were like four phones that anybody could sort of sign out and if you if you missed you know the f four f phones were being used you, you you jump in a car and go to a meeting in you know, a hundred miles away nobody could call you mm -hmm. um and then you know you could say oh yes the meeting finished at five so i then went home and then later your boss finds out that the meeting finished at four you should have come back to the office i mean that just doesn't happen now does it mm -hmm. you know we have that flexibility and that trust is there hopefully uh it should be anyway at least but yeah i think probably mental health and the approach to supporting people um, is a very good, you know, um, thing that's that's progressed, a good, you know, part of progression in, in work life in my book. Mm. Mm. How do you think a leadership expectations will change going forward? Oh, gosh, that's a tricky one. Mm. Only just coping with today, let alone tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know, it's difficult to, to anticipate. I suppose the biggest change is going to be artificial intelligence and and, having, and sort of coping with that, but also embracing it and making the best use of it. And there's so many things that are coming through that I think, oh, I could, use, I could do that. That would help me. That would help me. Um, but it's, it's, it sort of feels like life's running away, you know, from us. If you imagine how it was before we had smartphones and it, it feels like it's the, the same sort of seismic step all over again. It's difficult to imagine what it's going to be like. Mm. But I still, I think, you know, part of the... The thing about, um, you know, human nature is that there's that sort of the human interaction still needs to be there and, and people need to feel respected and, tr and trusted and feel that they're empowered to do things. 
and, and take control to some extent of, of, of what they're doing, being able to choose that how, as I mentioned before. And I think sometimes as leaders, we forget that, you know, we forget that our people are humans. You know, they're not, they're not robots to be programmed to get work done and to just look at the output. And they, they in, in order to, to enable them to feel fulfilled and engaged and motivated to want to do the work and to want to work for you as an individual and to want to do the, the work for the organisation, they need to have that sense of feeling like they're heard. One of the things I teach is a coaching methodology which I've um, used, which is called LACE as in L-A-C-E, um, in actual fact, it's a bit annoying because the, the order of the letters is around the wrong way, but it says a nice word, so I'm going to keep with the lace. So the L is for listen. So I, I talk to people about really listening and engaging with their people, asking open conversations, reflecting back what they think they've heard, listening with curiosity and really, really understanding what the person's problem is or if they've got a problem or an issue or a challenge or an idea. And then they've got a choice of whether they go to one of the three other things, A-C-E. And it's up to them to choose as a leader which one they should go with of these three, or they could actually ask the individual, which one of these three do you want? So starting with A is the advice, you know, do you just want me to advise you? Do you want me to tell you what I think? Which is often the first call of action for, for a leader, but actually is my least favourite. So that actually should go at the end. But then C is coach. So how can I help you to come up with a solution that works for you? How can I support you? Can I ask you questions that will evoke some sort of awareness in you? And E would be empathize. So as I say, it's the wrong way around. So it should be listen, empathize first, coach next, advise last. Um, and it's really good with kids as well. When you've got when you've got kids and they come home from school and say, I've had an awful day at school. Mm. It's so tempting for us as parents to say, no, you haven't. It's fine. You liked it yesterday. What are you talking about? You know, and, and first of all, listen. Oh, tell me more. And what else? Why is that? How does that make you feel? Those sorts of questions. And then, do you just want me to listen to you? Did you just want me to empathise and say that sounds like a rubbish day at school? Mm. Or did you, did you want to try and come up with some solutions together? Or do you want me to just give you my advice? And they'll tell you. Yeah. They'll say, no, actually, you know what? A lot of the times, as an individual, when something has happened to you, you just want to talk. Mm -hmm. You just want someone to listen. You don't want advice. You already know what you're supposed to do. You just want someone there to share your pain yeah. to make you feel that you're heard and that's it like a problem shared is a problem yeah. like carved or maybe not solved but um yeah that makes such a big difference and i think yeah just the ability to ask questions rather than just jump to advice yeah. because also as a as a leader you don't want somebody who's coming into the office constantly asking you for advice because it's like, yes, you might have an open door policy, but do you want everyone to be going through that door every five minutes asking you what they, you know, they're supposed to be doing? Absolutely. And then it means that you, you have the burden of being the bottleneck of the one who has all the answers. Mm -hmm. First of all, you might not have all the answers. Maybe you do, but your version of an answer might be not as good as the other person so if, you, if they've been given the opportunity to come up with it themselves. But also it, it just ends up being that they don't ever grow. You know, they're, they're stilted by checking in on you know what you think um you know one of the one of the i think it is a simon sinek thing again actually where he says don't go into a meeting if you're the leader and say right this is the issue this is what i think da, 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 da. what do you all think because everybody will just go oh yeah what you said mm -hmm. <laughs> or you know or maybe not depending on whether they like you or not um you go into a meeting and say, I think this is the broad issue. What does everybody else think? Does that seem like the challenge we've got ahead of us? Okay, let's have a talk about that then. What do we think we could do to solve this? And then, you know, yeah, it's, it, 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 you know, it's up to you as leader to maybe corral that information and to, to make a decision ultimately. It's not necessarily, um, you know, a, 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 a complete democracy, but certainly getting people's input and then making a decision is the mm. better way to go. It's very hard to go against somebody who's very sure of what the decision is especially if it's your boss yeah and it's like well why are they coming to me if they already have a solution that i'm gonna have to argue my way to prove to them that this is better mm. as opposed to starting and just like listening to it first mm. talking about culture like creating and fostering the best culture for a company mm. what's your top five qualities of what the best culture is 
I don't think I can give you top five because I think it depends on the organisation and how they are to start with sort of thing. And generally speaking, it's going to be if it's a if it's a small business, which is my sort of sweet spot, it's going to be about the the owner, you know, the original founder, if, if they're still there. Um, and, it, and if they've set it up in their sort of their own um, personality, if you like, you know, generally speaking, it tends to sort of filter down from there. But again, I think it's about, you know, that communication piece, that sort of that trust and that and and the the. Um, yeah, the, just the sort of sense of the purpose and the vision, setting that out first of all, and and getting people to actually really feel like they've got ownership of that solution. So one of the companies I work with is um, is a water management company, which in itself doesn't sound terribly glamorous, and but they work for you know big organisations, Sainsbury's, Whitbread, the like, and their core purpose is to save this natural resource, which is limited. You know, that's their core core purpose is to help their customers make sure that they don't waste water that they that they use it sensibly that they know what they're consuming and they also they means that they can measure their cost as well and they know what their what their cost should be and get their uh, savings and we had a company day and the managing director was a fantastically charismatic really really good speaker and he got up and he said to everybody the whole business you know his his vision basically for the next 12 um 12 months three years to three years but the core element, the thing that people took away, even the you know the most junior new starter who's a, like a data analyst in you know in, in one of the, the data analyst teams, said to me at the end of the day, "I just feel like I really know what I'm doing here now. I'm here to save water," mm. you know, which sounds really, you know he's actually a data analyst. He's there to look at sheets and sheets of data, but that he get he got the reason why he was there, and he got the re you know and and that that the you know the managing director had said we don't want. Uh, clients who just want to save money because they're money grabbing. We want to we want to work with clients who are genuinely interested in sustainability. They're actually really concerned about the world's resources. Those are the customers we're looking for. Those are the customers that we work with, and that's what why we're so passionate. And it was just a brilliant, uh, you know, demonstration of that sort of visionary, purposeful leadership. But yeah, culture starts with vision. It's so clear that anyone at any level of yeah. the organization, doesn't need to read it on the wall, no. that it's just there, that you get it, yeah. that it's in every single fiber of, of yeah. the business, like yeah. how people talk, how people interact with each other, with the customers, like the behavior itself. Yeah. It's almost like you're, you're just absorbing it from every single part of the business. Yeah. 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 Talking about quitting, I did a video on to help people decide whether they should stay or quit their jobs. Mm -hmm. What are the top five reasons in your experience why people quit? God, you're asking me a lot of top five questions today. <laughs> wow. I don't actually know. Top three. That. I've never done a survey on it, but okay. my, my guess is going to be that that values piece is out of alignment. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the main, you know, the, the core reason that people just feel they're just this organization and me or, or my boss and I don't get on. I mean, a lot of it is about your boss. People, you know, there's that old phrase, isn't there, that they say people don't leave jobs, they leave their managers. You know, often it's that culture piece, and that, that values piece. Sometimes it's about going to get more money, wanting to get promotion, be feel frustrated where they are currently. Um, and some people just decide they want to, you know, actually, I know some of the people I work with just now have just, um, you know, there's a few people who have resigned um, because they wanted to go and work in a different place. So they literally wanted to go and work in London. So the organisation is based somewhere different. Um, and, you know, sort of feeling like they've got a another another chapter in their lives. I know a lot of people um, look at their CV or, you know, think about their CV and think, oh, I've been here too long. And they've got a preconceived notion that somewhere being somewhere too long isn't good for for their CV. You know, there's a mixed opinions on that. And mm. um, when I when I do do recruitment, which is from time to time, if I see somebody who's moved around a lot, I'm a bit nervous about that. When someone has jumped around a lot, it's also very hard to then convince the client yeah. that they're going to stay there. Mm. And what I prize very much is the ability to find people who are going to be staying within that business and actually making an impact. Yeah. But it depends on the industry. Within certain industries like tech, for example, or even social media, people don't tend to stay that long, especially mm. when it's a very, very young new industry because there's just not really that many of them to go around. Mm. So they get headhunted quite a lot. Yeah. And from an individual perspective, 
if you have moved around more frequently, your salary will just be higher. Mm. So that's also the reality that if you stay in one job for too long, mm. then your salary potentially will be lower compared to the market. Mm. But the toxic boss for me is mm. pretty much yeah. the, the number one or the lack of progression, like yeah. the ability to get to the next level within the organization that, that you kind of, you know, you've been there long enough, but you, and you know, you can do it, but there isn't an opportunity for one reason or another. So. Yeah. And sometimes there just isn't, particularly in, in, mm-hmm. in um, smaller organizations mm-hmm. where there just isn't any room. Yeah, no, for sure. Mm-hmm. Talking about the differences between men and women. So this is something that's very close to my heart. Have you noticed any differences in leadership styles between men and women? Um, yes. Although I don't generally like making sweeping generalizations. <laughs> I don't generally like doing that. Um, it's funny because some people sort of say to me, oh, have you experienced sexism in your, in your career? And I can honestly say I haven't. I don't know whether it's because I haven't noticed, <laughs> right. I've sort of chosen That's, to ignore yes. it, mm-hmm. just pushed on through anyway, mm-hmm. uh, or whether I've just been lucky. You know, my first job was with um, <laughs> with my first job, and I still actually work for him now. It was with a man called Marcus Robertson, who's an absolutely brilliant, brilliant man, um, and and can be excruciatingly annoying as well. But but love him as that as way I, you as learn to have those tough conversations. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> and he's you know, he's a great a great businessman, a great businessman, really really good at spotting talent. And, um, and you know, yeah, fantastically charismatic. Uh, and his mum wrote the Wombles, if you know what I mean by the Wombles. Okay. Do you know? Do you know that? I know your, your y- yeah, vaguely. Yeah, yes, yeah. I do know the name, but part of yes, your upbringing. But yeah, yes. definitely part of my my generation's mm-hmm. upbringing was the Wombles on TV and the little you know cuddly animals. And the, and the fantastic books that his mum wrote. So he his his uh, he was sort of brought up by his mum and his and his uh, grandmother and. Um, and he and and his as a sister and was surrounded by women all of his his life. So he definitely is not sexist. And he you know spotted talent whether it was male or female or non-binary. And he would you know support whoever it was. So I had a, my first fifteen years of my career were sort of um, you know gender unbiased, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. So so I think possibly that's got me off to an almost you know an unprecedented or an unusual start in that I didn't sort of see that there, but. Yeah, I suppose that, you know, the the generalisation of women and men, you know, the good bits about women are they tend to be um, more intuitive and more uh, empathetic and more sort of, you know, keen to understand the individual's circumstances. Um, On the other hand, and also really good at, I know it sounds cliche, but very good at multitasking. Um, and the men tend to be, and it is a sweeping generalisation, but tend to be more single-minded, more focused, and therefore potentially sort of more decisive but I, I i i sort of i'm a bit resistant about clubbing everyone in in, in into two two camps mm. because i've met lots of decisive women as well so mm. <laughs> yeah it's it's going back to what you were saying about having that early start of yeah. working with somebody who was very oh, how do i say it very thoughtful in their leadership and also you said like not sexist and treating everybody in the same way but sounds like a very very good leader yeah and there's not really that many people who have had not only just early experiences but even working for somebody who treated people well regardless of their situation Mm -hmm. and really kind of you know got people yeah up yeah and he he was marcus is really one for um seeing a talent in somebody or seeing a seeing something a seeing potential in somebody and then um pushing them to to get to their potential sorry almost before they were ready to mm. so he was often promoting people when they were like really seriously i'm getting promoted you know in the marketing mm-hmm. agency account manager account you know and i was on the board at 27 i was managing director at 29 that was thanks to his belief in me mm. um you know i don't think it would have happened anywhere else if I'm honest. That's yeah. incredible mm. because having somebody who says, well, I trust you. Yeah. I think that you've got the skills and all of a sudden you're like, oh, there's that responsibility yeah. on you yeah. to deliver on someone's expectations. Yeah. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you're like, well, they believe that I can do it. Exactly. Therefore I can, yeah. as opposed to the reverse mm. saying, 
well, you're you're not quite ready yet. You're not, you know, you're exactly. not quite you're quite good enough. And then you're yeah. like, okay, maybe I'm not. So then, what's the point of trying, even, yeah. right? Mm. No, that's um, that's really interesting. Yeah, some people come to me um, for coaching and say um, they think they might ever have imposter syndrome. Those people talk about it all the time, and and I sort of slightly challenge them on it and sort of say, you know, you know, what does imposter syndrome mean to you, and what do you mean by that phrase? I think people have fallen into using the phrase when actually they just mean they're lacking a bit of confidence in a particular area, and that's not what imposter syndrome is, or mm. certainly not my understanding. My understanding of it is that it's much deeper, much more um, at a sort of core level of who you are, you know, your ad- identity level really really deep inside you and 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 you think you're a fraud and you know you, you shouldn't be in the position so it's not in. situational it's more to do with you as a yeah. like the whole yeah. being identity exactly. right exactly and mm-hmm. it needs a lot more work than than i would necessarily offer to do as a as a as a leadership coach and there are coaches who specialize in imposter syndrome and i definitely would recommend going to one of those but if it's really just a confidence thing then then it can be um uh, yeah you sort of let's look at that on a on a on a on a, as a sort of more detailed level, so, you know, when people say, "Oh, I've been promoted to a director of whatever," but I think I've got imposter syndrome. So I dig into it a little bit deeper, and I say, "Well, how did you get that job?" And they go, "Well, you know, I had to be interviewed, and then I had an assessment day, and then I had to do a thing against other people, and blah blah, blah or whatever the, the the process was to, to get them there." And even if they were just identified by the chairman and were told they were going to be the director, whatever the you know, it doesn't have to be a formal assessment um, routine, but they got it. They got it fair and square. It's like and, that's and evidence. Exactly, that's the first bit of evidence. And then I, and then we, I help them with building an evidence um, pack, effectively, of uh, of everything that they've got that they can see and that that they can write it, it down in a list. And literally, it could be a one liner of you know, I was given, you know, I I, I got the, I got the promotion, or I you know I I secured the new role. And then it might be, you know, and I delivered a presentation that didn't get laughed out of the room <laughs> no, and so on and so on. And literally everything that you can think of that you did, I made a cup of tea that somebody said thank you for. Mm. It can be as simple as that. But building it up and writing it down as, as, as evidence and reading it. And it's quite important to write it I, I, um, and write it and read it. And then next time you're going into a situation where you're feeling a bit nervous, you've got that little bit of anxiety, you've got a presentation to do to the board, whatever it is, you read your evidence pack. Actually, I've got this job fair and square. Mm. Yeah, That's such a good tip yeah. where you write down all of the positive things, the evidence, so to speak, yeah. that you have done that to make sure that whenever you go into a new situation, that you can just like refer to it instead of thinking all of those, you know, oh, I'm not yeah. good enough. Or I don't feel confident. Yeah. Then you go back to your positive list yeah. that you have yourself compiled, but based on someone else's kind of yeah. like assessment yeah. of you. And your own sense of yourself, you know, right. that, you, that you, I, I did that and it felt great. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and also it could be empirical evidence, you know, something, you know, new business thing, new one or whatever it might mm. be. Um, yeah. These sort of limiting beliefs that we have, uh, uh, you know, can be very, controlling and you know because you know whatever you you know our thoughts our our brain doesn't know the difference between thoughts that are real and thoughts that are false so if you think i'm rubbish at this or i'm not good at this i challenge people to just put the word yet at the end you know i can't you know i I, i'm not i'm no good at presenting i say yet because you haven't had the training once you've had the training you'll be good at it it'll be fine and then uh, so sort of building this sort of uh, antidote if you like to these limiting self-beliefs is, you know, can be really powerful, but it takes a little bit of work, lots of self-reflection. Mm. Yeah. At the core of it is taking time to pause yeah. and spend time in yourself, mm. accepting that you may be lacking in something, but also accepting that you have something. Yeah. So it's about being completely honest with yourself and realistic yeah. and to sit in that discomfort of something either making you not feel so confident or perhaps you are not doing the right thing, but spending that moment to reflect on that, to be able to either say, you know what, actually my belief is incorrect or maybe I need to have a completely brand new belief to empower myself. And then perhaps maybe I'm doing something wrong that I need to Mm -hmm. get some help, get some coaching, get some time to address those things in myself Mm. so yeah i think it's very powerful self-reflection is so very powerful yeah yeah because we're built to look out for danger aren't we that's you know that was our original 
you know, how we've evolved. We haven't really evolved terribly well in that, how we interpret signals or signs or, or, or sort of senses of things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where, where in a, you know, when we were cave people, um, you know, we'd be looking out for the danger of a saber-toothed tiger or, a, you know, an a, a, a enemy tribes, people or whatever. You're constantly on the lookout for danger for danger and just sort of wolfing down whatever the food was that we could get our hands on. Whereas actually what we should do is savour the good stuff, savour the lovely chocolate cake that we've got and and not be constantly, uh, oh, no, yeah, you know, I don't want to put my head above the parapet, I don't want to speak in public because that's nerve wracking, but actually just you know, savour the moment of the things that are, are great, you know, savour the walk in the countryside, savour the time with your kids, you know, savour the, the, the food on your plate and remember the, all the good things and but actually really properly enjoy them and have gratitude for them. It mm. makes, it makes a big difference. I do feel like our stresses have become we always get stuck in them. Mm. And because we sit down, we're so sedentary, we sit down so much that the stress doesn't have anywhere to go. There is no outlet mm. because it's like, oh, your boss said something, you know, maybe scathing or maybe they looked at you the wrong way. And all of a sudden it's like the most important, most terrible thing that happened in your day. Or you receive an email from a colleague making you feel bad, but you don't have an outlet. If you were hunting or running away from a saber toothed tiger, you're physically yes. getting that stress out of your body, mm. whereas it doesn't have anywhere yeah. for it to go. Mm. And I think in terms of managing stress, it's that ability to process it but also recognise that yeah maybe that scathing thing wasn't that scathing in the first place. Absolutely, I was going to pick up on that actually and say often we it's the interpretation. You know, we 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 make assumptions about the scathing look, but actually the scathing look might be that the boss had a headache or had just had a call from their spouse having a go at them for forgetting to pick the kids up from school or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know. You know, you, we we all imagine that the the um you know the the mean email I think was another example you gave from a colleague is is purposeful directed at us you know has a hidden me or not necessarily mm. hidden meaning but a meaning that we need to look into and actually it might just be that they were in a rush and they just didn't think it through and actually they need some training on how to communicate more clearly yeah. and it's not all about you you know it's it, it is often mostly about other people so somebody was saying to me that they were in a, in a management meeting which is a relatively new setup in this in this organization and they're all sort of equal and uh, one person asked a question of the other person. And so person A asked a question of person B, and person B was a bit crisp in their reply and sort of said, I don't think you need to know that, something like that. So person A was saying to me, oh, you know, why was person B so crisp? And I said, well, have a think about it from the other point of view. You know, what was the question? What, do you, what could have been his interpretation? And, and why might he have reacted in that way? Anyway, she got to the end result, which was he probably didn't actually know the answer. <laughs> was probably the reason why he was crisp mm -hmm. because she in public could put him on the spot mm. she was like oh yeah mm. it probably wasn't the fact it wasn't personal to me it was just that the way i made him feel in that moment wasn't great There's so, so much mind reading to yeah. be done too exactly yeah mm. yeah so it's it, it's sort of about you know making assumptions on 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 the reason for somebody's way of communicating with us and then actually you know, could it be different, it's particularly with email, you know, or with text, mm -hmm. people, people into, you know, people will say to me, oh, this is the email I got from my boss, da, 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 da. And I, and, they, and it, it was a cross, you know, I think you'll find that, da, 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 da. And I say, okay, read that again, but read it from a point of view, imagining that he's really pleased with what you've just said. Mm -hmm. And they read it again, and it's a completely different email, same words, different tone of voice. That's the tricky thing about managing yeah. your work life through texts voice well voice notes maybe yeah le less so but mm. different problem with them all together texts and yeah to short ways of trying to convey mm. information but um, yeah you're right it's not all about you no. <laughs> <laughs> and i think if we take that out of the equation first yeah. then come back to it then that makes a big difference mm. what books can you recommend about leadership I've got a few, and they're not necessarily leadership books. One is The Intentional Leader, which I really like. Can't remember the name of the author, but I'll get back to you on that one. Another one is The Coaching Habit, which I really like as a blueprint for how to, as a manager, be a good coach and, and really do that enabling piece that I mentioned before. And then one is a, a completely different. It's not really a leadership book at all, but it's Understanding People, which I think is such a core thing, and actually Understanding Yourself. And it's by a psychologist called Dr. Julie Smith. You might have seen her. She's all yes. over on social media. Love but her. why has nobody mm -hmm. told me this before? It's a really 
really great book. It's very mm. accessible, really, really well and easily written, but just, yeah, really, really good book for mm. anybody to understand anyone. It's on my reading list for September. I'm a ah. bit behind on my reading, <laughs> but I'm going to put it back in the mix. Yeah. And um, no, I think what she's doing is really great, bringing complex psychological concepts in a really clever way on social media, mm. much like what you're doing as well on social media, where it's, You've only got like several seconds to hook somebody in and you've only got so much space to be able to express the story and the problem, but maybe not necessarily a solution each time, but mm. the idea is to just make you think and maybe make you think in a different way. And I think that's really powerful. I know mm. there's many critics of, you know, social media culture and the five second attention span and whatever, but it's an art to being able to tell your story and hit the nail on the head within a very short period of time. And I know that even when I'm crafting very short videos, sometimes it takes me longer to do those mm. than something which is more long form yeah. because you have to think of so many different angles of how it's going to be perceived. Mm. Um, but no, those, those great book recommendations. I'm going to check, definitely check them out. And what's the best piece of leadership advice you've received? Oh, I've received... Hmm. probably going to be about nurturing talent I think because I think if you can spot talent in somebody else even if it seems to be hidden underneath a, a sort of shield of, of defensiveness or, or you know, apathy or whatever mm. it is you can see somebody's got something and you can get it out of them I think probably one of the things that I love most about leadership and the, the, one of the things that I've loved doing in my career is when somebody, a manager's come to me, usually, you know, quite often a new manager has come to me and said, oh, so-and-so's a nightmare in my team. I can't deal with them. They're going to have to go. Can you help me? Because I've been in HR. You know, can you help me manage them out? And I, and I nearly always say, unless I can see it's, <laughs> it's not going nowhere, but if I can see a, some potential, a chink in there that could be, a potential opportunity I said and just just give you know give me some time with you to coach you to be a better manager to get the best out of them and to be able to say to somebody else they've gone from one foot out of the door you know nearly gone to actually you know three months time employee of the month type of thing that's the best thing for me that you know, I absolutely love that that's what lights me up is the is the turning somebody who was you know, maybe having a bit of trouble, not being a troublemaker, maybe into somebody who's really valuable and a really integral part of the team. That's just joy. That's so interesting because so much of our problems in the workplace are from not understanding what the problems are mm. or not seeing the wood for the trees and falling on our own assumptions and that ability to step away from that, reflect on first yourself, then the situation, and then be able to make those minor tweaks can be completely revolutionary. Yeah. It can be from wanting to quit your job to then loving your job because you have taken control of yourself, the situation, and being able to manage that. And as a headhunter, one of the most prized people that price talent that I look for are the individuals who have gone into somewhere that was challenging, yeah. you know, managing the teams, managing the boss, owner, founder of the company, and also the business, and then turning that around and making those changes. Mm -hmm. Because those people, that ability to see beyond what is, mm -hmm. and that ability to make that change is what makes somebody extremely valuable to yeah. an organization. Yeah. So I think with the work that you're doing, is it's changing lives it's changing companies it's so important so what's the best way for people to reach out to you uh probably just jump on my website it's probably the easiest thing there's a uh, contact me page there and there's ways to book a call that's probably the easiest thing so waterfallhill.co.uk Great. We'll put that in the show notes Thank and, um, and definitely check out the TikToks because they are yeah. super fun, hilarious, and, um, might make you smile, might make you realize that you might need to make some changes and talk to Kate, but thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. <laughs> You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.